We're going to get into the nitty gritty of intermolecular forces or van der Waals forces today. I've started out with a list up here as far as what the decreasing order for the strength of intermolecular forces is. And you will notice that I've added a few um, areas in here that he didn't necessarily concentrate on so much in the book. But I wanted you to have a complete list as to what the orders of these different strengths are. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work my way uh, through the list from strongest to weakest, and I'll stop and talk about each one of them as we go through this. So the um, strongest types of intermolecular forces are when you actually have bonds. And we spent uh, lots of time in first year chemistry talking about bonds. Um, you're familiar with ionic bonds, uh, which is when you have a substance normally made up of a metal and a nonmetal that's going to split apart into ions, especially if it goes into solution. And um, those substances are held together by the electrostatic attraction between a positive and a negative ion, like sodium chloride would be an example of something with an ionic bond. So remember that ionic bonds include, um, involve a transfer of electrons, covalent bonds are a, um, a sharing of electrons, um, such that you're going to find in something like um, hydrogen chloride or in a lot of your carbon hydrogen compounds. Um, and then um, you're also going to have something called a metallic bond. A metallic bond, uh, and we're going to hit this a little bit more later in the chapter, um, a metallic bond is really where you've got um, electrons that are able to kind of move a little bit more freely and aren't stuck so much with their particular atom. But again, we're, we're going to hit this a little bit later in the chapter, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it right now. So if you actually have an, a bond, that's going to take, take precedence. It's going to have more strength than these other interactions will. Um, the next thing on the list is an ion dipole. Well, before we can really talk about what that means, we need to talk about what a dipole is. Um, I forgot to mention, I just saw, saw it written down here. When you are trying to determine um, which ionic bonds are stronger than other ionic bonds, there are, are two characteristics that you want to look for. Uh, one is the size of the ion and the second is the amount of the charge. Now, it's probably pretty intuitive that the greater the charge that you have, uh, the stronger the attraction is going to be. It may not be quite as intuitive that the smaller the ion, um, the stronger the bond is going to be. The smaller the ion is, the closer your electrons are going to be to the to the protons that are inside the nucleus. And of course, it's the, the positive charge and the negative charge that are going to be strengthening bonds. The smaller the ion, the more the nucleus of those atoms can pull on the electrons of the, the neighboring um, atoms. So if you're trying to determine which ionic bonds are stronger, look for um, which ions have a higher charge and for which ions actually have a smaller size, because that's going to indicate um, your stronger bonds there. Okay, now back to where I started a second ago. I mean, in order to talk about what an ion dipole is, uh, we've got to know what a dipole is first. A dipole is simply when you have a polar molecule, and hopefully you're familiar enough with that. In fact, you spent some time yesterday reviewing it on some things that I gave you. And so a polar molecule is where a covalent bond is shared unequally and you have positive and negative ends. Again, we talked uh, quite a bit about that, um, not only in module three, but also in, in your first year course. So for example, if you have um, hydrogen chloride, um, the electronegativity, which you were reviewing yesterday, remember electronegativity is the pull of an atom for more electrons. The higher the electronegativity difference is, the more polar the bond. So in a, in a bond between hydrogen and chlorine, the electronegativity of the chlorine is much higher than that of the hydrogen. So it's going to pull the shared electron towards itself. And so this is going to be a partially um, negative charge on the chlorine, and we'll have a partially positive charge on the hydrogen. So this is what gives me a dipole. If I'm going to have a dipole-dipole interaction, all that means is that when this hydrogen chloride molecule comes up close to another hydrogen chloride molecule, the other one is going to orient itself so that this chlorine is going to be next to um, the positive charge on, um, on the hydrogen on the neighboring molecule. 
The same thing is going to be true here. If another chlorine is going to come up, another hydrogen chloride molecule is going to come up to it, the chlorine is going to be um, the one that's going to orient itself towards that positively charged hydrogen. Whoops, that should be a negative sign there. Okay, so they're going to orient themselves in a way so that the negative, uh, partial negative charges and the partial positive charges are next to one another. Okay, that should all look very familiar to you. Um, an ion dipole simply means that if I throw an ion into here, um, let's say that for some reason I would throw in a positively charged sodium ion, the sodium ion is going to be attracted towards the negative end of this molecule. That's an ion dipole interaction. I just have a, um, a polar molecule with a positive and negative end interacting with um, an ion that would also happen to be in solution. I'm going to skip hydrogen bond for just a second. We're going to come back to it. And then a dipole-dipole interaction was what I was talking about when you got your hydrogen chlorides and they're turned all different ways so that the na partial negative is attracted to the partial positive end, okay? Now, when you have an induced, either ion-induced or a dipole-induced dipole, what that means is that you have an ion that's gonna get close enough to um, another atom, another, I'm sorry, another molecule, and it's going to cause the electron clouds to distort. So obviously if I've got a positive ion and it gets close to even a non-polar molecule, it's gonna to wanna to pull electrons toward itself. So all of the electrons that are orbiting around this non-polar molecule are gonna shift just a little bit because those electrons wanna get close to that ion and that's going to then make what is normally a nonpolar molecule into a, a dipole because the strength of this ion is going to be distorting the electron cloud around it. So that's what um, an ion-induced or a dipole-induced di dipole is. Um, when you actually make a dipole out of something that wouldn't normally be a dipole because of the influence of something else that's close to it. All right, so... Um, that takes care of our ion dipole, our dipole dipole, and our ion induced and dipole induced dipoles. Okay. Um, now I'm going to skip down and go to a London dispersion force, which is the very weakest of all of these. Um, I'm kind of holding off on hydrogen bonds because I feel like you know something about them, although I'm going to hit them in just a second. So don't think that I've skipped it completely. A London dispersion force. Um, is generally within mostly nonpolar molecules. Now, all molecules are gonna experience a London dispersion force, but they're really only significant in nonpolar substances because that's the only intermolecular force that there is if you've got nonpolar substances. If you've got ions, if you've got um, other dipoles there because of polar molecules, the London dispersion forces are there, but they're so weak in comparison um, that we don't really even think about them so much. So, um, again, a London dispersion force is more of a, a distortion of an electron cloud. And so you're going to get, um, the way that he describes it in the book is you have a molecule and these electrons are continually moving around. And at some flash in time, you're going to have a place where I maybe end up with more um, of the electrons on this side of this molecule than I do on this side. And so, again, very temporarily, I'm going to have a, a, a small dipole created just by the shift of the electrons within this nonpolar molecule. When that happens, this negative end can get up close to another molecule, and this negative charge is going to drive the electrons away from this part of this molecule, which is going to give this a partially positive charge. Now, again, these are normally nonpolar molecules, so we're talking about very weak interactions here, and it's really just a shift in the electron cloud. Um, it's nothing like uh, on a dipole when you've got a polar molecule. It's just a, just a distortion in the electron cloud that causes a very slight charge. Now, these will strengthen as the number of electrons in a molecule goes up. And so another way to think about that is obviously the, the more electrons that are available, the chances that that's going to happen are going to be greater. And so as the mass of a molecule increases, the number of electrons is going to increase. Okay. 
Additionally, as the contact area of a molecule goes up, then the chances for these dispersion forces or these dispersion forces are actually going to be stronger as well. Some molecules are going to be in, in a nice straight linear fashion. Um, they're, they're pretty straight. Others of them, um, the way that they've got different molecules attached together, you may have things sticking out here and things sticking out here and things sticking out up here. And you'll see some examples of this as, as we go through um, some of your homework problems, okay? But the more linear the molecule is, the closer that the molecules can get to each other, the closer they can get to each other, the more likely it is going to be to happen um, that these electron clouds can then distort, okay? So as the mass goes up, the number of electrons goes up, and as the, um, the linearity of the molecule goes up, the more linear it is, um, then the stronger that this London dispersion force is going to be. Okay, so we've now hit everything on here except for hydrogen bonding. Again, hydrogen bonding is something that you should be very familiar with um, because hydrogen is a very polar molecule um, or water is a very polar molecule. That's where we usually discuss hydrogen bonding is in the terms of, of water molecules. But hydrogen bonding can happen anytime that you have an oxygen, a fluorine, or a nitrogen involved. And that's because the electronegativity difference is so great. These are very polar molecules. And so the lone pairs of electrons on any of these three, if you also have hydrogen involved in the mix, it can interact with the lone pairs here and make a hydrogen bond. So it's really key that you look for these specific three elements in a compound to see if you're going to have um, any type of hydrogen bonding take place. As an example of that, um, if I would give you a compound that looks like this, CH3, CH2, CH2, OH. Uh, we're gonna start looking, these are actually some organic molecules. We'll hit some organic chemistry a little bit later in the course. Um, but if, if you see something written like this, what that means is that, I'll go over here, I've got a carbon that's attached to three hydrogens, and then I have another carbon that's attached to two hydrogens. So here's my CH3, CH2, then I have another CH2, so another carbon that's attached to two more hydrogens like that, and then it's attached to an OH on the end, okay? so. This kind of notation is going to look like this kind of a molecule. That's what that means. Now, what you can see here is that um, in a Lewis structure, this oxygen is going to end up with two more lone pairs on it. And so this is going to be a polar end of this molecule. The oxygen is going to pull the electrons toward it more strongly than the hydrogen will. So this is partially negative. This is partially positive. And so just like in water, this hydrogen could be attracted to the alone pairs on another molecule over here. Um, this oxygen can be attracted to the hydrogen, partially positive hydrogen on another molecule. Okay, so anytime you're, you can see any kind of a bond between oxygen, hydrogen, fluorine, hydrogen, nitrogen, hydrogen, all of those are going to give you the, the potential for hydrogen bonding. And you should assume that that type of bonding is going to take place there. Um, I want, do want to point out that that hydrogen bonding is what explains a lot of the properties of water, uh, how water has a very high boiling point. Um, that hydrogen bonding, it's hard to pull it apart, so you have to add a lot of energy so that the molecules can actually pull apart from each other in the liquid form and go into the gaseous form. That also explains why ice floats on top of liquid water. The solid is less dense. That is true for very few other compounds in nature, um, but it is definitely true um, for, for water because the hydrogen bonding uh, makes this structure in the liquid water um, that actually holds it together and then the solid actually is less dense th than it is, okay? Um, it's a, a marvelous, um, testament to the wisdom of our creator in that he made water that way because that's the only way that a lot of your organisms in your in your creeks and in your rivers are going to survive during the winter time because the water floats or the ice floats on top allowing them to be down towards the bottom to continue to survive 
Okay, water is content is classified as a universal solid because um, with the way that it is able to have this strong hydrogen bonding and this, this very polar molecule, it's able to dissolve a whole lot of things. Uh, it's got a very high heat capacity. Heat capacity means that in order to get it to heat up, you have to add a whole lot of heat to it in order to make the temperature rise. Uh, you may have noticed that if you've ever been at a, at a lake um, in, the, in the late spring or early summer, the temperature outside may be pretty hot and you're ready for a swim. And then you jump into that water and oh my goodness, it is cold. And it's because it just takes a lot of energy for that water to warm up. It takes time and energy uh, for that to get to the point where that water is actually warm. Um, high heat of vaporization means, again, it's similar to high boiling point, but if something's going to vaporize, it takes a lot of energy to pull it away from the liquid form and to get into the gaseous form. Also relates to high surface tension uh, because the molecules at the surface of the, of the water are connected or attracted to the molecules next to them the molecules in the body un, body of liquid underneath them, but not on the top because there's nothing ab above them in the air for them to connect to. So therefore, um, they, there is a high surface tension involved with water, okay? So all of these are very much um, qualities of hydrogen bonding. Let me show you another example of um, things that are bonded to hydrogen where hydrogen bonding makes a difference. Um, if I have... Um, hydrogen fluoride, hydrogen chloride, hydrogen bromide, and hydrogen iodide. All of those are acids, and all of them, if you remember what an acid is, will donate a hydrogen ion when you put it into solution. Um, the interesting thing about this, though, is that these three, hydrogen chloride, bromide, and iodide, these three are all strong acids, but this one, hydrogen fluoride, is not a strong acid. And why would that be the case? Um, if you recall, a strong acid means that um, the amount of dissociation into ions is very, very high. It's going to dissociate practically all um, of its molecules into ions. And so the, the more it dissociates, the stronger the acid is. And so these three are strong, so that means there's a high amount that is gonna dissociate, but this acid is a weak acid. Why would that one be a weak acid? Well, it's a weak acid because of this hydrogen bonding. The hydrogen and the fluorine are held together. Um, the molecules are held together so strongly within the liquid um, that it does not want to lose that hydrogen to dissociate um, because of the hydrogen bonding, okay? so. Um, a situation like this then is one that you want to when you really watch out for and go, oh, okay, the difference here is probably hydrogen bonding because of that fluorine that's involved. So watch out for that kind of stuff. So as um, the homework that you're going to be working on is going to say, all right, compare this to this. Which one has the higher melting point? Which one has a higher um, boiling point. Which one has a higher vapor pressure? So what kinds of things do you need to look for when you're analyzing that? Well, the first thing you want to check for is the polarity of the molecule. Um, the greater the electronegativity difference, the more polar the molecule is, the stronger the forces between the molecules are. The greater the mass of the molecule, the more electrons there are, we talked about that over here, the more electrons that there are, and so the greater the chances that those electron clouds can get distorted and form, um, form dipoles. The greater the linearity of the molecule, the straighter the line that it's in, the easier it is for those molecules to snuggle up next to each other and bond together and have an attraction between them. So the, the more linear the molecule, the greater the strength of the attraction. And so therefore, the stronger the attraction between them, the higher the boiling point is. It's gonna be that much harder for the molecules to pull apart to get enough energy to actually uh, boil or to actually evaporate. Vapor pressure, if you remember what vapor pressure is, what that means is that if you just have a liquid sitting out and if you have a cap on the top of it, you go so you have a closed container, um, the vapor pressure is what you get when some of the molecules at the surface are going to evaporate and go into a vapor. 
And so if, when in a closed container, the more vapor molecules that you have at the top, the more pressure there is. And so the, the pressure of the vapor goes up, the more evaporation that there is. So therefore, since I have to have evaporation to take place for, for vapor pressure to exist, the easier it is to evaporate, the higher the vapor pressure is going to be. The stronger the bonds between the molecules, the less easy it's going to be for those to evaporate. So the stronger the bonds, the vapor pressure is going to go down. All right, let's look at um, page 107 um, and let's look at example 4.1 there and talk about some of those. So the first question there is, which has the higher melting temperature, SFCl or Cl2? All right, if you look at Cl2, since you've got a chlorine bonded to a chlorine, there's no electronegativity difference in there at all. But if I have SFCl, there is electronegativity difference between the sulfur and the fluorine, between the sulfur and the chlorine. So that's going to give me um, a polar molecule. And the polar molecule then is going to have dipole-dipole interactions, which is going to be much stronger than a nonpolar molecule. Okay, so if you remember over here, um, a nonpolar molecule like your, um, like your chlorine is only going to have London dispersion forces. Whereas SFCl is going to have um, a, going to have dipole dipole, so that's going to be um, higher. So therefore, the uh, higher melting temperature is going to be the one of the SFCl. All right. Uh, the second question there: Which has the largest vapor pressure, liquid bromine or liquid iodine? Okay. So again, both of these should be nonpolar molecules, but I'm going to look at the mass of the molecule. Which one has the higher mass? Well, if you look at the periodic table, um, iodine has a higher mass than bromine does. When iodine has the higher mass, that means that since the mass has gone up, the strength has gone up. When the strength goes up, the vapor pressure goes down. So what that tells me is that iodine is going to have the lower vapor pressure, which means bromine will have the higher vapor pressure, okay? Finally, um, if you look over on page 108, you'll see a couple of um, molecules like the ones I was talking about uh, when, I, when I took this and put it into this form. This is what I was talking about, about linearity of molecules. If you look at... Um, the molecule in, uh, in letter A there, you can see that all the, chlor all the carbons are in a nice straight line. If you look at the carbons in letter B, you can see that those carbons are now arranged in a T-shape. Both of them have four carbons. They both have the same number of hydrogens, um, but the carbons are arranged very differently. Which one of those compounds is more linear? Well, obviously the one in A is a, is a straighter line. And so if I bring a second molecule in that looks like that, they could snug up against, to each, against each other. And so then it would be easier for those electron clouds to distort, whereas that is not nearly as likely in a more T-shaped molecule like you have in letter B. Therefore, because the linearity of the molecule is higher, the strength of the intermolecular forces is going to be higher in letter A, and we were asked for higher boiling point. So the stronger um, the forces, the higher the boiling point. So that means that the molecule in letter A is going to have the higher boiling point, okay? So hopefully you are able to see how we are going to use these three things to determine um, which one of the two molecules is going to have um, certain interactions in it, which is going to cause then your higher boiling and melting points and your uh, lower vapor pressures.